Today is March 26, 2019. I'm Brent Nally, and I'm here with Dr. Ed Park. Hello. How's it going? Good, good. Thanks awesome. for coming down. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. So I'm here in Orange County. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely beautiful. Made the drive down yesterday with my wife, Lauren. Yes. And we're in your office, Recharge Biomedical. Uh -huh. And you focus on anti-aging, right? That's right, yeah. OK. So can you tell us a little bit about how you made a transition to anti-aging, and even before then, what kind of got you interested in sure. medicine in general? Sure, yeah, well I trained in the traditional way, which was I went to school at Columbia, did my residency at Harvard in OBGYN, and so uh, I pretty much came from that background until my dad got sick, and when he was diagnosed with brain cancer, I finally, at the age of 37, Googled why do people get old? It never really occurred to me, I just accepted it was gonna happen. And then the theory of telomeres and telomerase came up, and I was like, that really seems reasonable. And so I pursued that. I became the first person, or, or like the 19th person to take it, and the first doctor to prescribe a telomerase activator. And from that, I grew my uh, YouTube library. I started interviewing patients. So I've always been kind of open-minded like you. I think that's one of the things I really love about your channel is that you're very open-minded. And um, a lot of it doesn't resonate with me. So. As I began to see my patients improving, I began to do podcasts and learn more. I came up with a larger theory about why we age. That's wonderful. So I love a quote, the mind's like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. <laughs> right. And I always revert back to that. Um, this is going to be about you, but just real quick on me. When I was growing up, my mom is more of a social, she has her master's in social work. Mm -hmm. She's a Democrat. She was born in Manhattan, grew up in the North, moved around a bit, other states. Mm -hmm. She is a very loving, altruistic person. She's more on the socialist side. My dad, born and raised in Kentucky, Republican, um, Christian. I forgot to mention my mom's Jewish, mm -hmm. if they couldn't be any more apart. And my dad's a corporate defense attorney. At least he did mm -hmm. work for, he's going to be retiring soon. <laughs> Excited for you, Dad. So just sitting at the dinner table every night, mom over here, dad over there, it's kind of like, like that. So right. that, I think that's what's helped me develop an open mind. Right. And I wish in this period of time, people would have more of an open mind to certain things with the politics going on right now. You got to, yeah. It's like that James Carville, Marley, what's her name? <laughs> They're opposite. Right. You know, I, I think that we live in a time, and I know you read my blogs, and a lot of times people get mad about they think I'm a Trump supporter, and then I came out with a blog about how I love Jimmy Carter, and yes. I'm like so left that I probably came around to the right. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's just so weird, the times that we live in, There's, it's very tribal. So it, it, you really benefit from having two tribes that were at war but loved each other. So right. I think that produced an open-minded person. So. That's the key. I've thought a lot about it, and I really think it's love. It's love that conquers everything. And my parents showed me that over and over again growing up. So. Yeah. Um, I did read your blog on Jimmy Carter. It's fantastic. We'll have a link below to Dr. Park's blog. He just wrote this one a few days ago. And can you just give a quick synopsis of, of Jimmy Carter? And Yeah, you know, I, I always appreciated him. And I, I think I try to contextualize it. You know, we came out of Vietnam and Nixon, and people just want an earnest, like, Jimmy Stewart kind of Mr. Smith goes to Washington president. And that's what they got. And if you look in yep. the history, the last hundred and something, maybe 200 and some years, it's mainly hand-picked guys that were doing the company work. But this guy was an aberration. Yep. And it's interesting, they actually created the superdelegate system after him, because they didn't want a populist rising up again. But the things that people think in very simple little stories, and so they remember he wore, wore a sweater to save energy. And he <laughs> said that he had lusted in his soul, in his heart, but not with his body. I mean, all these things, they kind of, and then they blame that whole Iran hostage thing on him. Right. So if we look back at the real history of what those things meant, they kind of labeled him as sort of a beta male and not a good guy, too weak. But so I kind of maybe took another look at that and re, re approached that. Definitely, and he looks pretty strong right now. You wrote the article because he was just became the longest lived American president Correct. of all 94, time. 94, yeah. 94. Which is amazing because, as you know, I also blogged about his metastatic melanoma. Right. His entire brain was covered with melanoma, which is usually a death sentence. I thought he was donezo when I heard about that two yeah. years ago. But now it's completely gone, no evidence of disease. And <laughs> it just kind of speaks to the whole premise that I came at, 
at in my first book, Telomere Time Bombs, that cancer is probably with us all the time. I, I'm going to give a lecture in a couple of months at a symposium, and the three things I want to tell people is it's not rare, it's not hereditary, and uh, it's not fatal. So the fact is when you do autopsy studies of guys that die in motorcycle accidents, you find cancer in their prostate a lot in their 20s and 30s. So it's, it's probably a paradigm shift that people are not ready to make, but we're probably making things that could be cancerous all the time and just defeating them or they're killing themselves, so yeah. Definitely. I, I've read in certain journals, and it's hard to know what's true and what's not, but I've certainly read that your body produces about 10,000 cancer cells every single day. I mean, you have 30 trillion cells in your body, mm -hmm. but a healthy immune system immediately recognizes those 10,000 cancer cells and just destroys them. That's it's right. the unhealthy immune system that allows that to grow and eventually metastasize over you know years and, yeah. and decades. And so, yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's like a hotel fire. When people think of hotel fire, they think of the MGM Grand. But you know, there's probably little fires in the hotel all the time, and ashtrays and stuff that's put out with an extinguisher. So I think that that's a paradigm shift people are not ready to grasp. But the problem is that when you give chemotherapy, when you scare the heck out of people, you actually you know, when compared with placebo or a good diet or a good attitude, you might do better with the latter. Right. But the, the pathway, once you get shunted in there, is just, we know it's kinda not gonna work, but let's just do it anyway, because the best right. we got. So I think, you know, I've started to question as a result of my dad's illness and what he went through after two years. Maybe it's not the best, you know. Definitely, and your little fires analogy you just used there, I wanna point out, reading uh, everything that you've written on your blogs and your three books and also following your YouTube channel, your podcast. I love the way that you describe things with certain analogies like that. You're a very unique teacher in the sense that you really get me to rethink things by envisioning them. And the way that, I know there's so many different types of learners. I've been in the e-learning industry with Linda, right. and, Linda and LinkedIn yeah. Learning. So I know the data on how many different types of learners there are, and I know that I'm a more visual type learner. Yeah. So maybe that's one of the reasons I love your <laughs> <laughs> writings yeah. and analogies so Thanks. much. Um, that's fantastic. So could you, so you talked a little bit about, you know, growing up and what got you into medicine and your maybe non-traditional path into that, although everybody probably has a non-traditional path. But can we talk about a little bit where you feel like we are right now and without giving away too much, definitely grab telomere time bombs and the telomere miracle. But talk about where you feel like we are right now in medicine and where you hope we'll be in 10, 20, 30 years in anti-aging, but where you also believe we'll be. You know, what kind of research needs to be done to get to the hope and what kind of research maybe you believe will actually happen, you know, to get to uh, it. That's a great question. and. Uh, I think when you look at it from 40,000 feet, you know, you have to understand that academia, research, corporations, government, they're all kind of playing together in an ecosystem. So for example, our tax money goes to the NIH, it funds certain grants, and maybe the corporations use that, and, and it's all, they're all kind of in the same game. So their incentives aren't always aligned with us. It's kind of like the insurance company and the drug company maybe is not aligned with the doctor and the patient for right. value. So a lot of people want to publish articles about this theory of disease, or, and they, they're very specialized and reductionist. So I think that the, the voices in the wilderness now are kind of the more integrated, holistic. And you know that can only get you so far. I mean, you could talk about energy and good vibes, but what is it really? So I, I'm trying to like not rule out anything in terms of what causes disease, mm -hmm. but bringing it back to my area of interest, I, I concluded pretty early on that telomeres, because they're implicated in s all disease categories, and it's a universal truth. You pointed out truth. so brilliantly in your book. It's, it's undeniable if people yeah. look into it. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's not just correlation, it's causation. So right. does that mean that taking a telomerase activator will keep you healthy and young forever? No, because as I've now, my thinking has evolved to more of a five-dimensional aspect. So really we live in a world, as you know from your stem cell research, your stem cells are always reproducing, replenishing, but mm -hmm. they're also acquiring mutation. Right. So it's a balance of five things, you know, 
the birth of cells. You know, when you're born, they say it's one in 10,000 mesenchymal stem cells. Mm -hmm. When you're older, it's one in a million. Mm -hmm. So there's that depletion, there's that failure of the replenishing cells. I mean, there's also maintenance, mm -hmm. which is telomerase. But as you maintain stuff, like if you maintain a car or a TV for too long, it gets other damaged uh, side effects, mutations and gene silencing. So just being able to maintain something is not necessarily a good thing either. And then there's destruction. So healthy destruction is a normal part of our ecosystem. So if we can mitigate those three things, control them, and in each of those three instances, there's a video I'll, I'll link to, I explain how if you turn up or down any of those three things, which I liken to the, the Hindu tree murti, which is you know, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva, you can get aging or out of balance. But the last two dimensions are entropy and time. We're all going through time. And entropy is just disorder. So as we copy our DNA, you get an average of one mutation every three divisions. But it turns out that the epigenetics, the genes that are turned on and off, that process is much less reliable, actually. So now we have an epigenetic clock. We know that you know, it's nowhere close to the reliability of copying the DNA. So the switches that the software copying is really problematic. So that's really where we're probably heading. So to answer your question, where is the future? The future probably is in, uh, you know, harnessing stem cells and also the signals they produce in the form of exosomes. Right. And I know you've been really interested in exosomes. I keep up with a lot of the anti-aging different experts and it seems to be that they're mentioning exosomes a lot more. Can you just tell me what research you've been doing on exosomes recently and why you're excited about it? Sure, sure. Yeah, I just blogged last night about it. I'm very excited. I, and it's, you know, I get, in my field, I get a lot of emails, people saying, well, have you checked out C60? Have right. You checked out P you know, it can be P overwhelming, P right? Yeah, and everyone always is very excited about the next big thing, mitochondria. But, you know, I was excited that uh, my mom volunteered to be the guinea pig, and I injected her. And it really was very transformative. Her, her entire energy, her enthusiasm, her appearance changed immediately. So I'm like, wow, this might be really something. When you say immediately, do you mean like within minutes, hours, days? Like the next day. Wow. She, she called me up and she said, I look like a different person. I feel totally different. And my sleep was totally different. And I go, I don't believe you. So I drove up there and took a picture of her. I was like, you, you do kind of look different. And then three days later, we went hiking in the hills. And she's like 82. She had the energy to drive us back. Me and my son were in the car, and she was driving us back. I mean, it was just crazy. Right. Yeah. I talked to a gentleman on the phone a few hours ago. He's looking at potentially doing uh, MSC IV infusion. And I got this question from him, which I get from a lot of people, and I've thought about it a lot myself. That sounds too good to be true. I would know about this if this were true, you know? And what I told him is, you're not going to see this probably on the mainstream news. You're going to see the Kardashians or whatever the, the news cycle is going on. So unfortunately, I believe right now you kind of have to be watching YouTube channels like mine and yours and other like-minded people to find this information. But can you talk a little bit about why you believe that is and what we can do to, to change this? Because this is exciting, incredible stuff, which has happened to your mom, right? Well, yeah. Well, you have to kind of ask yourself, what role does the FDA play. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ostensibly to protect us from things that are bogus or fraudulent claims. But, you know, they do a good job in keeping away from stem cell therapy as long as it's safe, regulated, minimally altered. But yeah, when you do watch, say, a Joe Rogan and Neil Reardon, you're like, oh my God, could this stuff be true? Right. And you kind of have to ask yourself, and that's something I went through a lot with the TA65 telomerase activator. Mm -hmm. People would say, well, it sounds too good to be true. And I'm like, I know. I, I don't believe these people either. <laughs> right. I'm very skeptical about what they're saying. But uh, I think that at a deep scientific level, you have to go with what's likely to be true. Mm -hmm. And what we know to be true is that Mesenchymal stem cells are crucial and they can differentiate into all different types. Mm -hmm. And they're what come in to regulate dysfunction, infection, cancer, immune regulation. So they're like the quarterbacks, the conductors of what's going on. So the fact that you can take them and the fact that they're not that immunogenic, you know, I think is exciting. Um, so it seems to be very safe and it seems to be very effective across a broad range of modalities. Now, 
you know, when you look at clinical research, it's always under the aegis of academia. People ra can't really patent and own, like Merck can't own stem cells. Right. So they're not really interested in pursuing that. So really the onus is upon mavericks like Reardon to say, well, I believe in this, I'm gonna put myself out there. I'm sure it's lucrative, but it's also high risk for him. And he's putting it in his own body, like you're also, you've been using TA65 for 12, 12 years, years now, yeah. right? And you know, I like to tell people, if you were to just snap your finger, use your imagination, and say all your MSCs out of your own body are gone, you'd be dead within about one minute. Yeah. So they're crucial to life. They help your body heal and survive and thrive so of course, getting more of them <laughs> is probably gonna help you. I mean, I can't disagree with that. You know, in Korea, and they have this uh, life insurance cord, or I mean, MSC banking. I know mm -hmm. you and Lauren just underwent the same thing. We did. With uh, which I've always wanted to do, but it was, you know, very expensive and the storage and, but yeah, it makes sense. I mean, this is as good as you're gonna get, you know, if you could have saved them when you were 21, maybe better, yeah. but it makes sense if you're gonna get an autologous transfusion, if you're going to recharge your bone marrow, might as well be a better version of you than 20 years from now. So Definitely. Um, before I forget, we've mentioned TA65, but I've been reading more about TAM818, and I'm, I don't know if you're aware, but I'm, gonna, I'm scheduled to interview Dr. Bill Andrews on April 2nd at Sarah Sciences, and I wasn't even aware until I did his book review that there's now a product he linked to his defytimes.com website. Either he's an affiliate with that mm -hmm. company or maybe that says, I don't know yet. But um, I looked at that product and according to the website, it says it's 80 to 300 times more potent, he uses that word potent, than TA65. So I'm just wondering if you've looked into that much, if you know much about it. I'm just personally still curious at this point, I haven't tried it. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I've known Bill for quite some time, and you know, the focus of CR Sciences is they want to find telomerase activators. Right. So they, they used a medical uh, chemistry library, and 818 was the number of what they found. And right. I, of course, I'm not privy to the actual scientific data. Yep. But I, I do know that, you know, uh, it probably does activate telomerase. Whether you want that much activation, I, I don't know. I don't know what the clinical effects are. So of course it's hard for me to comment. Right. I only know that you know telomerase activator 65 and and uh, the products that we're using are pretty safe and they've been used for a long time. Twelve, 12 years now at least people have been using yeah. them and you've been using them. You look great in my opinion for I your mean, especially for your age. Thank you. Yeah. I mean I used to have gray hair and now I'm 52. I can read up this close. So a lot of things that were present in my early 40s, even late 30s, are gone. But you know. Maybe you do want a stronger telomerase sector. I don't know. So I couldn't right. really comment. You'd have to ask him. Okay. I'll ask him and I'll find out. And to a certain extent, we are guinea pigs, you know. And I read a book years ago called 100 Million Guinea Pigs, which was the book that prompted the FDA. I believe it was back in the 1920s or 30s when this book, it was 100 million was about the population of the U.S. back mm -hmm. then. And so basically it was a ground roots movement where people wanted to get together and create an organization to protect consumers for foods and drugs and things like that. But as, as I believe you know, things tend to go through cycles. And I feel like with the FDA right now, we're just in a cycle where maybe there's been a little bit too much, um, I guess, trying to think of the right word, but maybe we've just gone through a cycle where it's too extreme with being focused on uh, not taking enough risks with people. Like, we, you don't want risks, yeah. you want things to be healthiest. I'm trying to phrase this properly. I, you know? I guess if you look at it, like any institution with three letters, there are good people, there are bad people, there are people with mixed reasons. But right. There is a sort of ecology between big pharma, the FDA, and uh, lobbyists, mm -hmm. which is troublesome. Now, having said that, the mission of the institution is a good one. Right. But there is a little bit What's most concerning about the FDA approval process is it's very cost prohibitive. I mean, it's tens of millions to get a drug through, and it's all about intellectual property. Like you two, you two billion, I've heard. Two billion dollars in yeah. a decade or and 12 You only years. have the rights, unless it's a compassionate use or an orphan indication, you only have a couple of years to have it before it's generic available. Right. So the whole system is inherently 
slanted to favor big pharma, right. high risk, and once the approval process goes through, all the complications are buried. People drop off like flies from whatever rare complication. It's like that movie, um, The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. It's right. like literally true that, you know. I loved that movie as a kid. Uh, I mean, but you know, the, 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 I think people what people don't understand about the FDA is that you get paid by the students that you're grading. So right. imagine going to a, a boarding school and the kids are paying your salaries. I mean, there's an inherent conflict of interest there. Right. Now, having said that, you, you know, we can't have Brett and, uh, and Ed's, you know, magic elixir going through the FDA and the taxpayer paying for it. Right. But think about the inherent conflict of interest when you're being paid by your students. By you know, it's just crazy. Right. Now, that's those are really good points, and there are definitely places on the planet where there's basically no regulation on things, and that's not what we want. I feel like because things can be bad. So um, another thing I wanted to mention was I talked to you a few months ago and I believe you said you were looking at maybe doing training or looking into the uh, umbilical cord treatments um, for your practice. Is, I haven't yeah, I did that. I did a training course. That's great. I received the treatment, but again, uh, you know, I'm pretty healthy. I don't have any aches or pains or yep. any serious problems, so I didn't really notice much from an IV infusion. Uh, but I think that would be quite different if you were infirmed or older. Uh, but again, you know, when we talk about stem cells, we always talk about the fact that even though they're not very um, immunogenic, it's not from you. It's from, the, you know, the clean umbilical cord stem cells of another person. Right. So there is the potential of rejection, but also the engraftment doesn't always uh, happen, I, you know. It gets diffused to the lung. Uh, so the question is, the next thing might be exosomes, because the way that stem cells work, it turns out, is not just from engrafting and reproducing and growing. That's actually uh, the signals that they send out in terms of these extracellular vesicles or exosomes is how they do their work. So they are trophic to a site of inflammation or problems, and they can either, by you know, penocytosis, they can actually create a bridge and transmit like a little data uplink. It's incredible. Or they just release these vesicles and the vesicles reprogram and change the behavior of the cells that need to change. So they're really kind of like the live uh, you know, play action quarterbacks on the field. They're going everywhere. It's just that we run out and probably they undergo mutation and uh, dysfunction as well. So younger is always better. So the fact that people are getting from a clean source, umbilical cord, Wharton's jelly derived, and they're keeping them alive clonally. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of safety from infection. Uh, so it's, 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 it's actually a very legit, uh, safe way to go. A question of whether engraftment is important and whether the immunogenicity is important and how long they last in the body. Those are unknowns that are no longer in the equation once we are using the exosomes. Because the exosomes are just, you know, the signal. So let's say in the future, uh, there's a great lecture which I can link to. Uh, Dr. Spiel talks about the fact that we're on the ground level. We're just kind of grasping in the dark. Right. But let's say you could cultivate stem cells that are reacting to a cancerous environment or an anoxic uh, cardiomyopathic environment. You know, These are like musicians. They're able to sing whatever song you pay them to play. So maybe we can get a more specific brew of all the cytokines, proteins, mRNA that are in the exosome as a result to an intelligent, you know, song request. So that's kind of the lev next level, next level stuff. But um, I mean, we're kidding ourselves if we understand we can sequence and look up on a chart what is being produced and what it could possibly be doing. But you know, biology is so much more complicated than what right. we understand. So yeah, the more I learn, the more I get excited, but the also the more I realize, wow, this is this is the beginning of a lot of these scientific understandings and evolution in the body is incredible. Yeah, but it's just like a musician. Like you go to Italy, you pay some guy to play a song for Lauren. You don't have to know how you know to tune a violin. You don't have to know you know what the notes are. You don't have to know how he memorized the melody or the harmony. Right. It's just you know he plays the music. It's great. You and pay him the five it. bucks or whatever. Yep. <laughs> So. Um, we were just in Italy last year. We did enjoy <laughs> it. My wife's over there oh, smiling. She's smiling. It's a good and, memory. Uh, we were in Italy for three weeks, and my goodness, 
pizza, pasta, gelato, wine. I did a huge fast after that and <laughs> yeah. went over to intermittent fasting. Um, are you still doing, I know you've mentioned in your book, are you still doing intermittent fasting? What are your thoughts on that uh, now? I'm with you on that. I think it's really important. You yeah. know, uh, it's, there's a re reason it's in the religious traditions. Mm -hmm. So whether you do it daily as an 18 hour fast, you only eat six hours a day. I know Terry Crews, the old spice guy yep. from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, he does that. Yep. Whether you do it a couple times a month, or you know quarterly I don't think it really matters I just think it's good for your cells to be uh, in rest regeneration and autophagy mode I, I've read that it helps your body produce more and better MSCs when you're intermittent fast I can just huh? speak personally I feel better yeah we my wife and I both do about 18 hours every day on average sometimes 14 sometimes 22 we go by feeling and then last week I just did an 87 hour fast and wasn't even that hard. A few moments. No, where you, it, you get hungry, but then after a while, you kind of break on through, and you're yeah. just like, "I feel good. Actually, I'm very alert." And yeah, it's a very strange evolutionary thing. If you believe in that, it's like that makes sense. If people need to figure out how to get their next meal, they yes. can't be all groggy and confused. Yeah, I tell you what, I had some Indian food on um, Santa Monica Boulevard a couple nights ago, and I, I almost died. <laughs> I mean, whatever was in the spices. I mean, I took a lot of Indian food. And I got a headache, and my body was just working triple overtime to try and process right. this. It was not good. So, yeah, I just felt compelled to not eat the next day because I was like, I don't feel good at all. I love that. So the key message there is listen to your body. And I just want to bring up, Lauren and I just sent in our Viome kit yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we'll be real interested to see what it tells us. I still think that we're in the early stage of this technology as well, too. Some people who I trust and value their opinion greatly have raved about the results and then applying that to their life and the benefits they feel like they've got from Viome. Um, others online seem, online seem to think that it's snake oil and stuff. So I'm just kind of interested to see what our results uh, show us and we, if we actually do that, which we plan to, to see if it has any effect and I'll you know share that. Uh, you know, I, I write a little bit about this in the book, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, I mean, there's nothing you could be right, wrong, partially right, partially wrong. The premise is not wrong, right? But it's like the old story with H. pylori, you know, that was implicated in gastric ulcers. The question is, why is the H. pylori pathogenic? Like, if I was to do a swab on any part of you, there's E. coli everywhere, there's yeast everywhere. So the the more interesting question is. What are the host factors that engender an unhealthy stomach or fecal biome? And so you're starting to get a problem of causation. Are right. you unhealthy because of the bad bacteria or the bad bacteria that because you're unhealthy? And so these are the much more subtle questions, you know. Feedback loops and... Uh, it's very unclear. Yeah. You know? Ray Kurzweil's book he wrote in 2012, How to Create a Mind, really drove home for me that they could see at that point that it's your thoughts that create your mind and your mind that also create your thoughts. It's kind of <laughs> that, that, that feedback loop that kind of you yeah. know, continues to build and compound on itself, which is why it's so important, I think, to keep an open mind, to focus on creativity and have a learning and a growth mindset. Um, we would talk about and selling e-learning that it's important to have your team, you know, the people that you're uh, trying to coach or whoever is around you to keep that open mind and that growth mindset and not thinking that things are fixed, especially in 2019, you know, that things are just the way they are and they will never change, you know. You want to be a, so a rational optimist. And yeah, that's so important. I was talking to both my sons last night about that and the, the sort of meta problem that they're having, if they're having, I mean, they're doing fine in school, but is the mind jumps. It jumps to the conclusion. It knows a little and it thinks it knows everything. Right. And I think what is important about being open-minded and open-hearted even is to come at it with a beginner mindset. And so that's kind of the gift of all the videos I've created on YouTube. You know, I was taught dogma through med school and practice and so much of what we do as physicians and as people is confirmation bias. Right. We think we know and we always look to find what we know. And then we're not open to learning and expanding and seeing the hidden truths, to shifting the paradigms. 
So I think that's true of everyone. You know, you you think you know, and then you kind of you go to battle with something that's not a complete understanding. And so when you know my son is struggling with chemistry, I'm like, are you sure you could really teach this back to somebody with no knowledge of chemistry? And if you can't, you might not really deeply understand it. You know, right? Those are really good points. So it brings me to think of a question, which is. What are you telling your kids right now? Like what kind of high level things are you telling them to think about with their long term career goals, life goals? And then kind of in that question, if you could also answer if it was you, Dr. Ed Park, pre-doctor, back when you were their age, but right now, what would you actually, how, how much do you think that would affect your life path if you were alive right now at you know, their age, your kid's age? I mean, that's a really difficult question. I know. Because, you know, <laughs> I'm in it. I probably should have listened to my mom and gone into plastic surgery. But, <laughs> you know, she was into the whole uh, be a doctor. You know, I think that the, the thing about being a parent and being a child, it's so difficult. And, you know, because you have, I don't know if it's in the epigenetics or in the culture or in the shared memory, but you have. It, transgenerational traumas, you have neuroses, you have issues, and a person can only acquire so much wisdom in one lifetime. Right. And the imparting of that wisdom is necessarily rejected by the adolescent I mental immune system. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, what advice would I give them? You know, I mean, in the end, what do you want? You want your kids to be happy, you want them to contribute, you want them to be connected. That's about it. As far as, you know, fields of interest, I said, you know, be a veterinarian or a stem cell scientist or, you know, a programmer in AI because those are fields that I think have an upside. As far as, you know, I think um, medicine is always great, but there are so many hoops to jump through. It, it hardly seems worth it, you know, in this day and age. Although, you know, it's a, it's a fun thing because you're always learning. And like with this exosome thing, I'm like looking up how to do knee injections and right. hip injections because like it's something that, it's a great honor and privilege to be a doctor because under that is the understanding that you can do stuff that's off-label. I can use exosomes to try and fix your knee because I've gone through a rigorous field of study over many years to know anatomy, physiology. Maybe it's not true to a certain extent. Maybe I'm not an expert, but certainly I have the wherewithal to have that expertise. Right. So, I mean, it's, I think it would be great if they want to be doctors, but you know, probably they won't, which is okay. And do you think that it's more difficult for your kids growing up in this world right now or less compared to when you were their age? I, I don't know. I wouldn't even know how to answer that. Okay. You know, there was difficulty is all relative. I mean, you, you can get on a plane to most of the countries in the world and life is really right. quite difficult. Yep. I mean, water, food, shelter, I mean, so it's funny, there was an article in Time last week or this week about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and <clears throat> the uh, millennials, how they're living in a time where there's not this abundance. I mean, it really shows kind of a lack of context, especially because right. the Newsweek article is like a 28-year-old woman, her also Alexandria Ocasio. Right. And her mom was executive producer at Colbert, and her dad was a writer at Newsweek, and she went to Yale. I mean. For these pe people to kvetch <laughs> about we're living in the worst of times because right. we're not all going to be paid seven figures out of college and, you know, be, uh, uh, I don't know, billionaires. Like, right. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's always a, a tension between expectation and reality, right? So most of the kids in this country are not going to be homeless or destitute. Are they going to own a house and have a decent working class job? Those are structural problems in the economy that, you know, not easily solved. Definitely. Now that's very well put and I think that the context there is key. And I think that a lot of these younger folks, people even younger than me, I'm 34, I can see as I've gotten older, they can lack context at certain times and it's just ridiculous in my opinion. Yeah. They don't even teach history. Like right. They don't teach civics. They don't teach the Constitution, home economics, American history. I mean, my son got through a history course. They were studying Hamilton and how to make a bill, 
They only got to the war of 1812, for God's sake. I wanted a refund on that <laughs> right. portion of my tuition. And they want to go see Hamilton, the play, rather yeah, than actually. Which yeah. is really quite dubious. But, you know, people really don't understand how far our country and the world has come in terms of human rights and progress and eradication right. of poverty. I mean, it's really not so bad. But it's because they haven't lived in a bad time. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, you know, I mean, you should always be skeptical when someone says anything with that phrase at the beginning. But, I mean, the gas crisis during Carter was so bad. Maybe right. it was artificial. Maybe it wasn't. People would steal gas from their neighbors by siphoning. <laughs> I'm actually learning. So how you to remember th that specifically? Yeah, like you could only go get gas on odd days, depending on. I mean, it was like bad. Yeah. There were shortages. That is crazy. And I know that. Carter had solar panels put up on the White House, and you know yeah. Reagan had them taken down when he right. came into office. But then I compare that with like the the Red Scare and people the duck and cover of the baby boomers, and they compare that with the Dust Bowl generation. I mean, it's it's gotten re it was really bad, and it's getting better. Right. I mean, human slavery at the beginning of the century. You know, I mean, it's really. Yeah, no, things I, are getting better. I mean, people should stop complaining. <laughs> things are definitely getting better, but it's kind of that paradox of what we do as humans is we tend to focus on the negative things. That's how we find out what they are so that we can improve them. You don't can't solve a problem. Well, at least it's harder to solve a problem if you don't know it exists. <laughs> so now with social media, everybody has a platform like both of us with our YouTube channels and things where they can point out the problems yeah. and some people scream louder than others. And so it's just this interesting time, but I think it's really important to think about the things that you said that things are way better now in general than they ever have been. I mean, way better. When I was 10 years old, I went to Korea and I wasn't, I've never been to Korea and I, I didn't have any conception. but. You know, almost everywhere you wanted to use the restroom, it was a pit toilet. Jeez. And you know, as a result of certain kismet and the IMF and real estate speculation, industrialization, hard work, it's like one of the most industrialized, like advanced, wealthy countries. Right. I mean, this happened in my lifetime. This was only 42 years ago. And I was like, I almost fell into a pit toilet and drowned. <laughs> I mean, what an ignominious end that would have been. But it's like, was really poor. So, you know, hopefully we can see that kind of development in other countries. I think part of the whole, I mean, uh, neo-colonial, if you want, mm -hmm. problem is that the IMF, the World Bank, you know, who do they lend money to and for what reason and what does it mean to the people? I, I, there's this great uh, crypto lecture given, I think, in Russia where this guy argued that these countries are the wealthiest. They're not dependent on a credit system. Uh, they have natural resources young people, but that the, the whole way that the system works, right. I mean, I would love to see not industrialization of countries in Africa and South America, but just justice, economic justice, because every one of these countries is run by a small junta of rich families yep. in collusion with international corporations. Yeah. It's like, what? So, you know, I want to talk to you when we do our interview yes. uh, about anarcho Poco, mm -hmm. anarcho you said it correctly, okay. uh -huh. because it's I think it's a tongue twister, but you yeah. got it right. But the the concept of anarchy is such a pejorative, has such a pejorative connotation. But right. actually, you know, there's a lot of people grifting at the top, and if we could just like um, make things a little more fair, you know, yeah, maybe it'd be I better. I think yeah, trying to find fairness is should be the goal, and I think that's what we're all after. We just have, when I use the word we, I mean people, 7.6 billion people on the planet. I think that people just come from so many different backgrounds and they're taught so many different things. So one individual's perception of fairness can be drastically different from others. But the key is, is it's all about learning, keeping that open, open mindset and constantly be willing to reconsider, you know, your own experiences and what you've been taught and why you believe what you believe. And the more you look yeah. at that, I, I think it's pretty clear that free market capitalism and you know open markets, freedom, um, but having some type of regulation to keep property rights and common law. You read history, you, you're saying <laughs> kids haven't been taught enough history. If you, need, if you read enough history and read enough economics, those things seem to me to be pretty clear to the recipe to success. Well, I mean, you know, it's astonishing that so many people want to go to 
wealth redistribution by centralization. Like, yeah. It's like the entire 20th century was a failed socialist experiment. There's a reason why Russia, the Soviet Union collapsed. People just don't work under socialism. But I would argue that uh, without being at all uh, facetious, I think free market capitalism is the best system that hasn't been tried. You know, no, you're, you're, you make a really good point. I, I mean, agree. the doctrine of too big to fail, we saw it in 2008. I mean, you were in the mortgage banking mm -hmm. system. You know, they basically took all the good banks that were solvent and they were bought up by the bad banks that needed a they bailout. Did. And you know, our deficit went from, I mean, our debt went from eight billion to 20 trillion, or eight, tr eight trillion to 20 trillion. Right. The numbers Nobody are so knows. big, you can't even say I right. mean, it's like goes to the moon and back in hundos, I mean, or the sun, I don't know. It's just, I, I think that when you really look at Free market capitalism it hasn't been tried. And then maybe it's for good reason. I mean, you don't want PGE to declare bankruptcy like they just did or require special protection. Things do get too big to fail. But if you think that the price of commodities or the, you know, whether mergers happen or whether telecom is regulated it has to do with principles of jurisprudence and fairness and equality under the law, you know, that's just not the case. Right, and for those watching who might not understand what Dr. Park is pointing out, first of all, I totally agree. You know, what you're clearly pointing out is that when you say free market capitalism hasn't been tried, is that most of the, you know, millennials and the, the socialists more movement of like the Bernie Sanders group, which is scary in my opinion, they're saying we've tried free market capitalism, it doesn't work, we need more socialism. Whereas like what I personally believe is we've never tried it and that the closest no, thing to it, capitalism. it's crony capitalism yeah. and it's and th the closest thing to it right now, in my opinion, is cryptocurrency because it really is a true grassroots free market capitalism as close to it to it as we can see. And you're even seeing regulation come in as much as possible um, and just in different jurisdictions geographically. Yeah, I'm interested in interviewing you for my channel about that because, you know, I think there are some very interesting aspects to that. But as with anything, um, it's very hard to know who's behind it, mm -hmm. for what reasons. I think we had a really scary year with the ICOs. Yeah. And uh, so I'd like to get more in insight. In 2017. Yeah. So before, so if you guys aren't aware, what we're planning to do is we're going to jump to Dr. Ed Park's channel. There's going to be a link in the description below. So this is going to be part two on his channel, doing a little bit more of interviewing me, more about cryptocurrency and whatever Dr. Park wants to ask. But before we jump to that, are there any other things that you'd like me to ask you or discuss? I know I had more questions, um, but just a few. Would that be okay if we take a few more minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one thing I meant to put in my book review of your book. Thank you um, for that. Yes, it was phenomenal and you deserve it. And uh, just, I remember reading this book as my wife and I were traveling the world last year. Mm -hmm. I think I read your book. It took me like three countries to read your book <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because <laughs> cause we're traveling like in yeah. a new country every five days or so and, and we're doing so much because you don't want to miss out on anything when you're in a country. We're in Vietnam. We were in the prison where John McCain was held captive oh, for yeah. two years. Oh, yeah. Hanoi, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That man is... Hanoi Hilton, yeah. You know, I used to think differently about him in my early 20s. He's, he's, he's a very strong mindset to survive that environment, to get out of there. But, you know, you might... There are a lot of vets that are not fans of his. I, I totally he agree. he got special treatment. Uh, the admiral made okay. a call... I and did he not was know that. Not treated the same as the others, by the way. Okay, yeah. I'm very glad you pointed that out because if he was treated the way most people were, I mean, people just died in there. You know, starvation, oh, yeah. torture, oh, yeah. and we walked through those those prison walls. But yeah, it took me three countries to read your book, but it was phenomenal, and I could see as I was learning certain things within the book how it was improving my life and how I was starting to make plans. You know, I was really impressed. You really did a great review. Um, and I know you said that it's weird that I talked about breathing, but again, when, when I sit down to write anything, I, I don't really write it. I just kind of open it up and let it come channeling in. Right. And I was like, you know, you talk about the things you can't live without, but breathing, I mean, it's something that is always Three minutes, us. maybe, for and the average person yeah. tops. And we don't really understand what it does. We think it's about oxygen. It's really more about acid-based metabolism, too. So. I, I again I think that's the one thing that I, I do well is forget what I know and try and explain and understand from a beginner mindset and that just it seems to be the clearest way to 
an intuitive ascertainment of what's real because there's so much bias. People think they know. I mean, I had famous people who read my book, they loved it, but they got stuck on the nutrition chapter. They have right. just too much skin in the game. They're like, I cannot endorse this book because right. what are you saying? It doesn't matter what you eat. You know, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I'm just saying, you know, people can survive on an Inuit diet of animals. Or you can survive on Eskimos, a Eskimos, right? Yeah. Said no Eskimo ever. I right. like how you <laughs> yeah, start right. off with your quote in that chapter. Right, we need to eat vegetables. Said no Eskimo ever. I mean, people are metabolic machines. And, you know, people have really strong biases about what healthy eating and not healthy eating. I almost killed myself with Indian food two nights ago. Right. I'm not, you know, the worst for it. People don't understand that actually digestion is absurd. I mean, you take a food, you break it down into component molecules just to be reassembled into the same molecules in your body. Right. It's really a process of detoxification of stuff in the environment. And there was a sad, uh, about a year or two, a person injected IV turmeric or curcumin in there. And they died. Oh, gosh. Because they Why just did they didn't that? get that, you know, there's a reason we digest. You're trying to break down the unsafe molecules. The liver detoxifies. All food is poison, and yet all food is medicine. I mean, if we could photosynthesize, if we could get, you know, IV, Star Trek nutrition, I mean, it wouldn't be very fun. It wouldn't be like going having gelato and pizza in Milan. But, you know, food is poison, but it's also how we nourish. So... I think these kind of ideas challenge people, but again, mm -hmm. on Facebook, I, where we met, mm -hmm. one of my friends from college just posted this funny paragraph of contradictions about what's healthy and what's not healthy. And I said, to her, well, this is why, you know, it's very confusing, and you have to look and peek behind and say, well, why does one expert from Harvard say this, the other expert from Hopkins say that? Well, guess what? They got their PhD, they got their grants, right. they're working for it. That's you what know, it this always company. comes back to, right? Yeah, everyone's Money got their the dogma and their confirmation bias and their salary. So I'm like, listen, let's just get to what's real in the science. You do whatever makes you happy as long as it's in balance. This is the best way. So the book, The Teal and Miracle, is really like a handbook so people can understand what is breathing, you know, what is diet, how does digestion work, exercise. I mean, I'm not a paragon of healthy living myself, uh, but so what? I mean, that's just how people need to be armed with true understanding. Because if you read one day that eggs are good, eggs are bad. That's I mean, what's in the news right it, now, it's right? It's my entire Facebook <laughs> feed. <laughs> if you're watching like, this in months or years from now, you're going to be like, why are they talking about eggs? It's yeah, what's going on right milk now. Milk is good, milk is bad. Avocados are good, avocados are bad. It's like superfood, poison. You know, they can't all be right. And yet they're not all wrong either. After so. I heard about the egg thing a, a few days ago, I went and I had four sunny side up eggs <laughs> because, of course, eggs are fine. Well, I just, it makes you wonder. You know, there was this whole romaine lettuce toss up. It's like, what? Yeah. You're, at any given time, there's E. coli and listeria and everything everywhere mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. But, you know, it's kind of like there's somebody pushing a button saying, let's see if we can freak people out about romaine lettuce this week, right. avocados next week. It's kind of diabolical. I don't know. You know, it, I took statistics in college, and I, and I know how these, this stuff works. You can fund any, who funded it, okay, yeah. is what you need to look at. What were the metrics that they used? It's the same reason I'm not a Trump supporter, okay, but I predicted in 2015 that he was going to win. And yeah. people around me or close to me that know this. And I did this working at LinkedIn, so in San Francisco. Most of my colleagues and friends like hated me, even though I never said I supported him, I just said, he's probably going to win. And going up to the last day, it's because you can look at the true polling and, and you can tell that he's probably gonna win. However, what the mainstream media is telling people is that he has no chance. That's the problem. I mean, that's, I think, where we come together as people who think because, you know, we might have our own biases, but we're open-minded. And right. that leaves us, hopefully, less likely to make mistakes. Because I think that, yeah, the polling was not just passive. It was activist. Mm -hmm. uh, it was selective. And, mm -hmm. and if you do statistics, you know that, you know, as I, I think it was maybe Twain or Disraeli said, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, yes, right? Yes, yes. And they always be manipulated. So I think that... We're living in a very divergent world where a lot of people who are just in, asleep in the matrix and want to believe everything, you know, they just can't cope anymore. It's really degrading their coping skills. Right. Because, you know, if you look at, you know, 
true organic grassroots movements, populism, um, nationalism, it's on the rise, and there's mm -hmm. a reason. And, it's, and, uh, and people don't realize that it's because the mainstream media is so corporate and so propagandized that they've nullified their own relevance. Nobody well, even right. believes them anymore. Exactly, and I was gonna, until you said that last part, I, I was gonna say, and at the same time, it's dying every single day and things are moving to a decentralized platform of mainstream media being decentralized like on this YouTube channel. Of course there's the <coughs> YouTube owned by Google, owned by Alphabet and the corporatocracy structure of that and the politics involved with the banning and things like that going on on different media platforms. But in general I view it as a very positive thing that more people can get their voice out and that we can have more open discourse on the internet. Yeah, I. I don't want to be cynical, but I, I really think we're in the last days of the internet. Really? Yeah. Share share your thoughts on um, on what you mean by that. That's interesting. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a week ago uh, there were some alleged shootings in New Zealand, and and you know, now they're doing gun confiscation, and right. they create a new felony for posting reposting a video. Crazy. 14 years for reposting a video. Somebody got 14 years in prison for reposting a video? Well, they were able to say that if you repost this video, you get 14 years in prison. The New Zealand government said this. Yeah. That's I mean, that's, that's just very crazy. quick action. Right. <laughs> it's just crazy. So, you know, of course, Facebook that allegedly live streamed it is not going to get 14 years. Right. So the, you have to ask very the question, good point. well, who is running these alphabet agencies? Yep. And it's no coincidence that it's called alphabet. So, yes, right. uh, the, you know, you have a lot of collusion between government uh, and, and different actors to censor, mm -hmm. to change algorithms. You know, um, if you do a search for certain unpopular or conservative ideas, you know, the AI is aware. Not only is it aware, it's actual tracking, and there's entire <laughs> server farms of everywhere you and Lauren has ever been, anything you've done and texted, right. all the location service. I mean, they're creating some kind of algorithm and profile of everyone. So one day, you can be easily pulled up as an enemy of the state. So the entire premise in the Post-Patriot Act, you know, with the empowerment of deep state surveillance, is really scary. I mean, you, there was once a, a, a day when they used to have to use England to spy on us. So mm -hmm. every phone call that came in and out of the country was monitored by something called Echelon, right? Yes. But now with the five eyes, you know, and the servers off-site, I mean, it's ironic that they're getting bit by this now because mass surveillance of everyone all the time is a two-way street. So a lot of these people that are going around trying to cause mischief are being recorded by competitive agencies. So I really think it's time to back off from all this surveillance. And I think when people really uh, understand the full scope of how much of their lives is being monitored and controlled, and they kind of think, well, I was just searching for, you know, buying a tractor. And it's funny, all these ads are coming up. Like, they don't even understand the depth of which, you know, the RFID chips and the cards, all their behavior is being modeled, monitored. And, you know, it's, and it's, sold it's, to it's corporations quite scary. To yeah. for target ads. Oh, yeah. There's so I think, you know, without a deep, uh, what is it, uh, dark web, mm -hmm. an anonymous web, which the argument has always been, well, people will do terrible things with it, but the, the That's what, who's creating that argument? Who's the one saying that? It's, well, you it's have to be very careful because it's very much of a controlled narrative. I mean, right. if it's to be believed, apparently Facebook was founded by DARPA as LifeLog the day they went down. Facebook went up. Right. So even like Tor, the onion router, right? Yep. That was a DARPA invention. <laughs> so the question is, you know, e even the founding of Satoshi Nakamoto, right. who was really behind it? I met a guy who said he knows unequivocally who was. But you have to always wonder who's really controlling the narrative. Is it a controlled yep. opposition? All these so called whistleblowers, Snowden, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I really. I mean, the You're most even skeptical of Snowden is potentially. Not, I'm not skeptical, but I just I doubt the, the official version of what okay. he did and why he did it. And then, and nowhere is it more of a smack in the face than this other whistleblower, a reality winner. <laughs> I mean, 
why would you name yourself reality right. winner? This, uh, it's just crazy. I mean, it's just I, like I the think sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, and it does make you question with a lot of the things that you've just pointed out. Plus, I'm sure you know hundreds more that we could discuss. You know, I read some of the headlines, and I'm like, am I reading reality, or is this a bad movie script? A lot of times it is. You yeah. know, be, and, and but people we can can't tell the difference. Yeah, I mean, well, the movies have gotten so bad, reality's yes. gotten so bad. We're and all you're reality a person, losers. I mean, you, you <laughs> talk about, you know, your Hollywood aspirations and, you know, yeah. fun, and, um, you know, you've written movie scripts, so you're a person who knows what you're talking about when it comes to those things as well. Um, well, the storytelling is very on the nose these days. I mean, people, they make up these stories about who did what to whom for what reason. Right. But they're not very creative. Like, right. reality is, is usually much more complex and subtle and subtextual. And But everybody's like, I'm a white supremacist. I'm going to go shoot up some <laughs> right. Muslims today. Right. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's believable. What? Yes. Okay. And sometimes yeah. that's the caricature that you see from the mainstream or whatever you're following on Facebook or social media outlet. But then if you look deeper into the story or maybe you look from the other side of the political story about that individual or that caricature, <coughs> you tend to find that in reality they're a little bit more complex and maybe not as extreme of a white supremacist in this case as they were portrayed by the other side. You know, once you see context revealed and you see other things, that's what I tend to find the more I investigate a general story these days. Uh, you know, I, I speaking of screenplays, I wrote a screenplay about um, an African American uh, jockey who was born a slave. He became a jockey, the most popular athlete of his time. He went during the Civil War. Amazing guy, and then he became a trainer. Won the Kentucky Derby, so I know a lot about Kentucky right. horse racing. I remember reading your blog kind of about that. Yeah, this, and then even an owner of a horse named Ulysses running in the Kentucky Derby. So there's this entire history that's untold about black jockeys in this country and the really unfair affirmative action against them. They wanted more white jockeys, even though the blacks were the best, so they had to have affirmative action for white jockeys. <laughs> I mean, it's just really nuts, but th the point of it is that White supremacy is just the latest in a series of enraging, conflict-making things. Right. And so the question is, who is guiding the narrative and for what reason? I right. mean, it used to be allegedly this Brenton guy, shooter in New Zealand, was talking about the Knights Templar. I mean, wow. you're going back. That's bro. back. That's I mean, you're going back. back to like... That's the, some OG type stuff. Yeah, right? like... He's like, well, the reason is I want to shoot up Muslims because of the Crusades. I mean, it's like, what? I mean, it's like this legislation anti-lynching. <laughs> you know, like, people haven't been lynched for a while. I mean, they haven't been drowning witches for a while. Why do we need legislation that's obviously hate crime and violence? You know, the so Winsome Salem Salem or, uh, <laughs> legislation should be passed <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, right? right? Immediately. I mean, it's Get like it witch burning. I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it, but right. it's like they're getting these really hackneyed story ideas and they're pushing them out there. It's really kind of sad. And I think that for me, we can talk about this a little bit more maybe when you're asking me more cha uh, questions on your channel, but Idiocracy. If people haven't seen the movie Idiocracy, <laughs> oh, they just it's so, have it's to. Oh, it's so real. Because yeah. it's sadly, so the movie was filmed in 2005 and it's becoming more real every year. Yeah. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to mention, you know, I worked for Hewlett Packard, HP, back, we got, I worked for a company called 3PAR, um, which was a SAN storage area network, um, data storage company. We did all sorts of things, backup recovery and things like that. And 2010, we got acquired by Hewlett Packard. And we sold to Google and their data center in Colorado. And Google just reverse engineered the technology basically over a few years. That's kind of what they what yeah. they do. We sold to Facebook, and so I kind of knew what I was talking about when it comes to data storage. And we, you know, of course, HP sells to the NSA and other government institutions. And so I would just kind of tell friends in private, you know, and family members, you know, about the situation with the NSA and with tracking and be careful. And I honestly couldn't believe it when. Edward Snowden came out and said that, and I, th I think it's interesting your, um, the things that you brought up about him, but I think that from my personal experience, I saw a change in education when he brought this out, and I view that as a positive, um, but it's still 
people still just, I feel like, only know a smidgen, maybe the tip of the iceberg, as far as how deep the rabbit hole goes with some of this tracking. I mean, and yeah, people don't want to know. I mean, this is what it is, you know. What is Palantir <laughs> Technologies? Why do they need Peer so much office space? Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I just think that the ecosystem that is built around mass surveillance and creating and reacting to threats is orders of magnitude larger than the real economy. Like the real economy of people who work for a wage and build stuff. Right. I mean, there's so much more money spent in the beltway on, on intelligence, military, threat assessment. Rea I mean, what? So, I mean, was anthrax even ever sent? If so, by whom? Right. But a whole industry grew out of that. And so, so many millionaires in the beltway. And the question is, who is creating all these threats? So maybe um, when, when you're asking me some more questions, I can give my perception of Please, how yeah. I kind of view that, because I have looked into that quite a bit, and I think I have a, maybe a more unique um, background and research history on some of these things. But before we jump there, I have one final question um, just regarding aging and things. So you know, I've researched, um, from what I've heard, there's many different animals. What we know for sure is at least whales, and probably also crocodiles, alligators, tortoises for sure, uh, flounders I've heard as well, that just do not age the way that humans age. In other words, their telomeres stay long and their telomerase enzyme is more active. And then even, I remember in 2012, I watched a documentary on this Japanese scientist who's been studying jellyfish for 30 years. And these people always amaze me, people have been doing like one thing for like three decades. And what I recall from this documentary is that these je jellyfish are just asexual. They just basically get old and then they just reproduce themselves. But it's like the same thing. And they don't have a brain like we do. It's wild. So can you just talk about just, you know, I personally believe that we can solve the aging problem, cure aging and cure diseases, because I feel like we've already see it happening in lobsters as well as certain animals. So can you just talk about your knowledge about the things that I just mentioned and how you feel about that? Sure, sure. I mean, you look at a giant squid or a giant jellyfish, where does it live? It lives in an ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a giant womb of warmth and food and nourishment. It can grow and keep on growing. So. Invertebrates don't have the same things that we have in terms of a puberty, a, a cessation of growth. So, you know, different rules apply as to how old a jellyfish can be before, you know, it gets caught. You know, we were driving to Mammoth and we were driving by the Bristlecone, Bristlecone Pine, you know, uh, park. And there's trees there that are 8,000 years old. So it's quite right that not all animals and plants age in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Andrews points out that moose moose or the r laboratory mouse is a mutant with extra long telomeres right. and that it meets its end usually from liver cancer. They have a high rate of tumor formation. So what is not as, so as, as interesting as why this animal or that animal, let's say that the elephant doesn't get cancer because it has so many p53 gene copies or the naked mole rat doesn't get cancer because it has contact inhibition. Right. These interesting specific instances elucidate a greater understanding, which is, again, the 5D model that I, I explained. It's like, we're all a balance of ecology, of, of stem cells, of maintenance, destruction, of data integrity. I mean, you said you worked in a storage area yeah. network. I mean, there is a lossy nature to copying DNA and epigenetics. Yes. And then, how does that evolve in time? I mean, I was reading an article about the germ cell, like our sperm and eggs. Yep. Pretty good. I mean, maybe they were better. Maybe we were 20 feet tall and golden gods. But, you know, over generation to generation, the sperm and egg have high data integrity, error correction. You know? They have to, or you'd be, if you're right, every generation 34, would be, you'd be, well, maybe <laughs> you'd be dead within a few generations. And maybe that's the true source of the idiocracy is that we are getting uh, <laughs> degenerate. <laughs> But, I mean, to answer your question, nobody knows. But it is interesting, and um, I do think that it's a hackable problem. But I think that the people that should be least trusted are the experts. <laughs> and that's yeah. been the leitmotif of everything I do, because 
You know, every time someone's an expert, they're not going to contradict what they say. I mean, I had a friend of mine say, well, you're pretty dogmatic in your views. I'm like, I'm willing to pivot and contradict myself on a dime because I know that the more I know, the less I truly understand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not a platitude. That's just the reality is that if you think you can look up something on the internet or see something in a chart on a biochemical pathway and ascertain wisdom, you really misunderstood uh, how hard it was for that guy to play Lauren's favorite song on the violin. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it was not an easy thing. And yeah. New Newtonian physics was perfect until Einstein came in and screwed everything up, you know, and yeah. Knox Planck and those quantum physics pioneers. And Newtonian physics is still great for many things, but we know that there's a point where it breaks down and quantum is a better way to understand the universe um, from that perspective. So I think there's a little bit of that as well, too, where it's like, let's keep the things that we know for sure. Two plus two equals four, and I'm pretty sure that it always is, or else I just tap out, I give up, <laughs> you know, right? There's, but there's also think about some things that we can reconsider. And, and yeah, question. I mean, a paradigm shift is not necessarily paradigm destruction, you know? You can That's just a good point. I've never heard that before. Right. Is that a is that a Dr. Ed Park? Did you just make that it up? Just or? came to me okay. yeah, right now. But you know, you, you build upon, you add, you aggregate. You know, just like religions. You know, maybe a truth was revealed, and everyone always says, "I'm the new prophet of the new church," and it's all just very ridiculous. You know, I, when it gets right down to it, what are the ultimate truths that we're looking at? You know. And I, to answer your question, aging is going to be very easily solved. Yeah. I think exosomes are a big part of it, uh, specific exosomes for specific reasons. What you're doing with bone marrow banking, uh, and mesenchymal autologous transfer, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like, why wouldn't you want to recharge your right. own stem cells? If you can, we have the technology to do that. If you're one in 10,000 at birth and one in a million, and then Seems 20 years from now, you guys are like one two in plus two three equals four. Thousand. Yeah, and people are asking people like, "Why trouble. are you doing these YouTube videos? I don't understand it." I'm like, "Guys, this is simple. This should be common sense." But the question, see, the thing that was you were liberated from around the dinner table was, uh, as a kid growing up, was dogma, it was yeah. the one camp thinking, and so much of our thinking is binary. We right. think, well, true or false, lie or trusted or. And we think, well, the truth has to be ascertainable that way, but it's really not. And the fact is that um, dogma is not our friend. I mean, the truth is complicated. It's always being improved upon. And, and so I think that, um, you know, that's the problem is people are always so convinced that this is the way we're going to cure aging. Right. And I say, you know, once you're focusing <laughs> on one thing, you're looking at the wrong side of the of the spyglass, yeah, and you're only going to find what you seek to find. Yep. So be open to all ideas. To a person with a hammer, every single problem <laughs> seems to look like a nail, right? Right. right. But you're not going to go to the mitochondrial expert, and he'll be like, "Well, I think telomeres are important. I think, you know, this or that. They're just, they're, what's in it for them? They're not right. going to contradict themselves." Totally. Well, Dr. Park, I think that's a great place to end it. Um, you know, for my channel. But guys, definitely check the link below. We're going to have a link to Dr. Ed Park's. Uh, video here and his YouTube channel. Check out all his videos on YouTube over the years. Incredible. I've learned so much. Yes. I remember remodeling our home in 2016. I was brave enough to do some of the demo work, and I'm sitting there watching your videos as I'm like ripping up carpet and stuff, and then yeah, I'd have you to rewind. I mean, I really, I blow my own mind by like learning that I really didn't understand something that mm -hmm. I was taught by very respectable professors back right. in medical school. Like, what? We were totally wrong about sugar or cholesterol or blood oh, yeah. pressure it's like whoa. sugar's terrible and yeah. i'm a sugar addict so i've had <laughs> lots of fun getting over that addiction and improving there a yeah. little bit um, yeah. anything else right now no thank you for sharing this uh medium i hope it interests inspires some people it doesn't make a lot of people angry <laughs> definitely people don't like to wake up they want to live in the idiocracy now you guys so. hopefully this doesn't make anybody angry this is supposed to be fun and educational yeah and get people to rethink a few things. And Lauren and I, my wife behind the camera, my camera woman, really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and do this. Thank this you. is a lot of fun. Beautiful. All right. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Click on that link below for Dr. Ed Park's um, interview of me.